The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. This is President Obama's Chief Technology Officer for the 2012 campaign. His name is Harper Lee. He's a big fan of equal rights and internet freedom and uh, net neutrality and all that. And that is the guy that got the election won for 2012 because he built a system uh, that could not be blown up. Um, and the reason is because he tried to blow it up every single week that he went into work and he would go into his uh, server stack and just start pulling out plugs and, and blowing up the system any way he could and his developers, uh, the team of 40 people that he personally recruited himself, figured out a way around it. Um, and when, when, when go time came, he was able to push data down to his, uh, his campaign workers and, and absolutely know if you were in this 10 block part of the city, these were the eligible and likely voters for, for that day. Um, and it, it totally kicked the other side's butt. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and this isn't, that's not the picture of a guy you would think could be a CTO of a, of a major organization. Uh, well, maybe this room would, because we're all, we're all dressed in self-clothes here. Isn't, isn't that cool? Um, the best thing in the world I love to do is pack for an open source conference, right? Let's see, I got my, I got my two, uh, two pairs of shorts and four shirts uh, and some underwear. Uh, I think I'm good. <laughs> All right. So anyway, let's pull up the. Uh, let's get going with the presentation. I am. Hold on. I did uh, bring your own PC last year itself, with the same pogo plug, by the way. Jason, were you here for that? I missed the talk. Ah, yeah, that's probably because it was Sunday at 2.45 and everybody was on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned from my experiences. Um, there we go. Let's... And it's showing full screen on my display, but not there. Oh, it will. Okay. Thank you. There's actually a glitch in it where if you attach it in one hour afterwards, you can't see it using the first presentation. It's just supposed to be open and it'll be there. The presentation will actually automatically work with your second All right. Let's try that again. Apologize for the technical difficulties. No, I didn't do it. I got it. I got a full screen on mine. And Okay. Yeah. There we go. Well, this is going to be really short.
You gotta be kidding me. It's showing full screen on my display. This is, this is my punishment for not learning X the right way. Sweet. So it, it, I guess it thinks this is a dual, dual display. Okay. Um, so let's see. There we go. All right. System settings. Displays. Then all I got to do is just mirror the displays. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right, this presentation is the Andy Cloud Headless Arch Linux on a Pogo Plug. I am Ben Francis, and this is the correct date June 20, 2014. A little bit about me um, I just started a company called Fosperts. Um, you can Guess what the acronym stands for? Free and open source software, experts, smush them together, phosphorus. Yay. Funded by hundreds of dollars of venture capital. Uh, bad joke there. <laughs> uh, first time I heard about, heard about Linux was uh, working for MCI back in 1995, and somebody was uh, talking about, hey, you know, Unix costs three hundred eighty thousand dollars per per copy. Is there any way we can uh, just uh, you know have have a, a Unix that we can play with? And everybody said, well, no, AT and T and IBM they they don't like that. Uh, so, but there is this thing called Linux that you can download and, and put on your put on your laptop, and it'll run just like Unix. Oh, okay, all right. So, put the put the bug in my mind. First conference I ever went to was. Linux World Expo 2000, New York City. Anybody there? Huh? Anybody? Nope. Okay. Um, and it was, I, I have to note that because I went to the conference and they had this big chart of a, the Linux kernel on the wall. And uh, it was the most complicated thing I had ever seen in my life. You know, one of these big ring diagrams with all the, with, with, with everything in, in the world on it that the, that the Linux kernel did at the time. Which is which is a lot, and just think how it's how far it's come in 14 years. But I'm looking at this chart, and there's this blonde-haired dude um, looking a lot like me, um, you know, standing next to me with his uh, wife and his, his brand new baby. And I only seen one picture of of Linus Torvalds in, in, in my whole life, and I'm like, man, that looks a lot like that guy. That is Linus Torvalds. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he was just a regular dude hanging out at a conference. He started his software. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, I think, I think a lot of the guy, and we all do too. That's why we're all here. Um, very self effacing guy. Um, last thing about me is I'm the president of the Columbia Linux User Group. Um, we have a, ma uh, a mailing list like most. Lugs do, and we do have a website, colalug.org. Um, and if you're ever in Columbia and you want to give us a talk on anything, anything at all, I'm always looking for speakers. 
So, everybody knows this? Berlin Wall, 1989, November 9th, 1989. Well, actually, this is probably November 10th, because uh, the uh, wall came down and it, it was just blew everybody's mind. Well, why am I showing it at this Arch Linux Pogo Plug presentation? Huh? What does this have to do with anything? Well, it has, has, has a lot to do with it. Um, I am right in the middle of all these people, right there. Uh, I, I can't pick myself out, but, but I'll guarantee you I was there that night. Uh, I was a young officer in the, in the, uh, in the Army at the time, and my, point, uh, my place of duty was having to be Berlin, Germany, um, just six months before, and then six months later, the wall came down. So, you know, you're welcome for all that. Uh, but I mention this because this was the, the jubilation and an absolute freedom of, of, of a country that had, that, that used to look like this. This was two years before. And I, I, I compare it to walking into a, a black and white postcard. Um, this was Berlin, 1987 on the East German side, okay? This is East Berlin, you know, this, the city of Berlin was divided into four sectors. French in the northwest, uh, British in the middle, and, and the Americans in, in the south, southwest. Um, and then the whole east side of the city was East Berlin. And of course, the entire city was inside East Germany. Anybody know that? The whole city was Inside, it was 110 miles inside East Germany. So it, it, it effectively was an island, and the only way you could get to that island was by flying in or traveling the, the special Audubon from, uh, from Ch Checkpoint Alpha to Checkpoint Bravo to Checkpoint Charlie. Um, everybody knows about Checkpoint Charlie, but there was a Checkpoint Bravo and a Checkpoint Alpha also. A little bit of trivia. If you were ever asked that in Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> but anyway, this is the country where half the population was spying on the other half, right? Uh, and, and really, not even getting paid for it. You know, they, they just don't, don't the, the threat, the only reason why they were doing it is because they weren't going to get thrown in jail if they did. And if they refused, they would get thrown in jail. Um, and there was absolutely no commerce walk, uh, going on. See that one person right there, um, the, the blurry one in, in, in the lower left. That was that was normal. You know, uh, it, it, it actually was kind of an anomaly because nobody was running, walking around. There was no commerce at all. There was no money, no money changing hands, no free commerce, no, no nothing like that. It was just once a week you went to the store and got your food and you went back to your apartment and you ate it. Okay, and. And, and this was all surveilled by an organization called the Stasi, uh, which was the uh, East German secret police. Um, and, and I just have to think about how, how incredibly happy the Stasi would have been to have 99.9% .9 surveillance of their entire US, uh, of the entire population of uh, East Berlin and East Germany. And that's what we have. That's what we have today. We got, uh, and the NSA brags about it. We got 99.9% .9 of the population surveilled in their PowerPoint presentations to themselves. That is what Snowden revealed and, and Glenn Greenwald. Apparently they weren't watching one guy. So, uh, this this kind of ticked me off a lot, a lot, um, as, as as I'm sure it did everybody in the room. I mean, we kind of knew about it, didn't we? In 2006, an engineer, um, uh, a network engineer, blew the whistle, went to NPR, and said, "Hey, I just saw some guy walk into a building on the West Coast, in in I think it was San Francisco, and put in a dumb switch that copies." 
all of the inter internet traffic that's coming in from the West Coast to the building next door. Why else would he do that? Unless, you know, and, and the building next door didn't have any signs on it or nothing. <coughs> it was NSA. Um, and uh, so we, you know, we had to think, well, they're, they're watching the traffic. And whoever they is, we don't, we don't know, but you know, now we know uh, because of uh, Edward Snowden, we know it was the NSA. Um, and, but you know, just the realization of, of, of Snowden publishing his papers and saying, oh yeah, it's, it's that bad and worse. They're just, um, the, the government is watching everything we do for no good purpose. Not one terrorist incident um, was was disrupted by this by this mass surveillance. We certainly didn't opt in for it. I mean, I guess I guess it's kind of nice having your whole life backed up to data to a database in in Utah. But you know, 100 years from now, that might be valuable. But right now, it's it's concerning. We've always loved privacy. Um, and, uh, you know, we've even put it in the Constitution, right? Fourth Amendment. Um, we will be secure in our personal effects and papers. Right? That's what it says. So, um, so I started to think about, well, okay, everybody, uh, the reason this is all happening is because we, we, kind of uh, accustoms ourselves to getting used to the cloud, right? And, and I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody, you know? 2009, I signed up for Gmail, um, like a lot of other people did. Hey, it's a great service. And, uh, and one of my Linux user group members says, you know, do you, really, do you really want to answer the, do you really want Google to answer the phone for you and hand it to you and say, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna listen to this while you, while you talk. <laughs> I said, well, but the convenience, the convenience is so good. I just want to, I just, I just want the convenience. It was, that, that would be so cool, you know, have all my, instead of just having a whole bunch of list of emails, just have everything packed in one conversation and, you know, all life would be happy and I can just kind of push off uh, as uh, plausible deniability that they're listening to everything. Well, of course they were. Um, and they're doing it because they want to market. Um, they want to market to you. <laughs> you might see a, a movie called uh, Terms and Conditions May Apply. You know? It's Netflix. You got to see it. You got to see it. Go to Netflix. Yeah. I mean, I hate to be, hate to be chilling for Netflix here because they're probably watching them. They, they absolutely know all the movies I watch. That's, that's for sure. But I'm willing to give that one up. Um, but yeah, terms and conditions may apply. Um, a couple of producers did a documentary on Facebook and Google and, and actually followed Mark Zuckerberg down the street and, and Zuckerberg's like, are you filming me? Are you filming me? <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as the producer says, oh no, I'm not filming you, his face turns all big and bright and says, oh, that's good. <laughs> and the producer says, see that? See that? That's how Mark Zuckerberg felt when he knew I wasn't when when he knew I wasn't filming him. But it was just like Mark Zuckerberg does when you go on Facebook and and like something, or if you just go to a web page and the like button is on there, he still knows you went there. You don't even have to be a part of Facebook, as long as the like button is on that page. Mark Zuckerberg knows knows you're there. I mean, he personally doesn't know, but his organization does. Uh, and that's why you know, uh, Facebook is worth you know, $4 billion. Uh, the producers of the movies said, hey, your personal information is not, uh, is worth about $500 a year, at least. So, I mean, I hadn't really thought about it. That I was, I was thinking, well, maybe you know, 10 or $20 a year, maybe something like that. No, it's, it's worth a lot more than that, because if you think about you know, your salary, Average salary in the U.S. is fifty thousand dollars. One percent of that, yeah, okay, I can see that. So, 
Um, so yeah, go, go see the movie, and then that's what kind of ticked off this whole this whole presentation. I said, well, you know, I I did the big, big bring your own PC to uh, itself last year. I said, well, this this would be a good topic to talk about because you know everybody's trying to do cloud, 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 um, and uh, if it's a U.S. company and it's a cloud provider. You, you just have to assume that, uh, that they've, if they're big enough, they've been pressured to, to release their data to, to three-letter agencies, right? LavaBit, CEO, uh, got pressured, and uh, to his everlasting credit, said, no, I'm not going to give up my secret keys to you, NSA, um, and, uh, and they shut him down. Right? So, if the one good guy in the pack, you know, shuts down, what is everybody else doing? Well, they were, they said being in business is, they obviously made a deal with the devil and said being in business is better than not being in business. <laughs> we're just going to play ball. Right? I don't mean to bring everybody down here. We all know this. We all know this, and we have to talk about these things, right? Or else uh, we're not going to figure out ways ways around it. This is this is my feeble attempt right now to to try to get around it. it, it I'm sure a security out, expert, expert out there is going to say, you know, you're just peeing in the wind on this one. But uh, and, and that may be true. But the knowledge of how to do these things is, is, is still important, and we, should, and we should get it out there and talk amongst ourselves and, and use great distributions like, like Arch that are made for small uh, embedded devices. Um, and it's a process, kind of like, uh, you know, you can't just have peace in one day. You gotta, it's a peace process. Privacy is the same thing, all right? So I put out an email to my Linux user group, said, I'm gonna start weaning myself off of Google products, right? I'm going to start going to DuckDuckGo instead of Google for searching, right? Um, and I'm going to start, I'm not going to use, I'm going to try to, I'll still look at Gmail just to, you know, I still got a lot of people that email me on that. But I'm going to set up my own server. Uh, and that's what I did. I bought a, uh, I bought a server, a um, virtual private server. Yes, it's in the cloud. <laughs> but I, I did that for Fosbirds and um, and I'm starting to use that and, and get things on my own terms. And the Pogo plug is, is, is one of them. Because I do have a big server sitting on my living room floor. Um, but it's also got a big sticker on it that says, this server uses 700 watts. And to run the numbers on that, hold on. Let's say, let's say it's not 700 watts, but it's 400 watts. And that top calculation says, well, OK. <laughs> That's a 400 watts, 25, 20, times 25 days, and 30, 30 days uh, in the month, by by 1,000, and multiply by 12 cents, which is the rate in Columbia for uh, electricity, and you get $34 a month just to run that server. Um, and 400 watts may be high or low, uh, but I thought, well, you know, I really don't want to run that server. You know, it's, it's noisy and all that stuff. Let's just get it to run on a pogo plug, uh, which is five watts and uses 43 cents a month, right? Uh, and that'll be the, the start of weaning my way off of Google. Uh, so I don't do Facebook anymore. Um, it, I know it's impossible just, just to leave the service, so I just, uh, you know, it's just like a, a dead tombstone out there. <laughs> um, I stopped using. Gmail, except for some stuff. Uh, like I say, I'm weaning myself off of it. And then, uh, then I found out that Ubuntu, this 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 distribution that I'm using right now, is playing the same game in in, in a way because they have a program running in the background called Zeitgeist. Um, and if you research Zeitgeist, you find out it, Zeitgeist knows everything uh, that you're doing and is uh, is reporting that to uh, to Dash. You start a Start a program from Dash, then that gets reported uh, 
back to canonical. So that's on my list of uh, things to, uh, to undo. And then last thing is uh, encryption. Uh, in Columbia, we're, we're the, the, lug, the lug there is, is totally focused on figuring out how to do, how to do PGP and open PGP correctly. Um, yeah, every, every third meeting, we are doing security, security, security. How do we do security? How do we, do, how do we generate keys? How do we uh, sign emails so that you know that the, the email came from me? How do you, oh, sorry about that. Uh, how, do you, uh, um, how do you actually encrypt the email so that it can't be read? What kind of, what kind of size key should you use? 4096, biggest you can get. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's that's what we're focusing on down at the in the Columbia log. So yeah, pr uh, so privacy is a process, and uh, and it's one of these things you just have to decide to do. You can't do it in one day. Let's help each other along in the process. Um, so you got to fight black. You got to fight back with the with the anti cloud, um, and you could call the anti cloud just how we used to do things or how we should have been doing things before cloud came along. You know, a lot of people hosted their own email servers on home, at home um, and got an IP and, and used a dynamic DNS uh, to, uh, uh, to keep that IP you know, constant working with, a, with some kind of uh, known DNS name. Uh, that's how we used to do it. I mean, that's what we should go back to doing. So, so what about what about the pogo plug that's that's attractive? Well, um, it's headless. It doesn't have it doesn't have a monitor, right? Uh, so I can just uh, <laughs> on every day but today SSH to it and uh, and figure out what's what's you know what's running in the background. It's running at run level three, um, which is normal for Arch Linux. That is the default for Arch Linux, isn't it? Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. Um, Jason said the, technically it's running on system D, so there's no such thing as run level three. But anyway, I've got it configured, so it just it, it doesn't even have X installed. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Multi-user dot target um, is uh, is the actual uh, run level. That's thank you, Jason. Um, so yeah, it's it's cheap. Uh, that particular Pogo plug right there is the E02 model. It, uh, I bought it for $25. Um, uh, Cloud Engines was, is, is a company that, that produces those things, and they, and they initially tried to sell it for $100 and had a whole bunch left over and just decided to get rid of them for $25. And, all right, well, otherwise it would be a Raspberry Pi, and then I could hook up to a monitor and see what's going on. <laughs> But, uh, but it's okay. I don't need to be running a monitor and running all that power anyway. Uh, it's power efficient. Five watts in the nomenclature. Haven't tested it myself. Has anybody actually tested one of these things to see how much power they actually do draw? Nobody? Yeah. Okay. Up to eight watts. Okay, so compare that to um, a 700 watt, you know, uh, rack server, and you know, it's a win all the way. You know, one one hundredth the power of of what you'd be using on a, uh, on a big old server. Of course, it, it doesn't scale. It's it's, it's not going to scale, but it's only designed for one person. So it's a server for one person. Perfect. I'm not serving ten, tens of thousands of people. Just me. Um, it's, it uses the ARM architecture. Um, this particular model has a Marvell 1.2 gigahertz chip. Uh, there is another model that has a different chip. Uh, what's, the, what's the other chip name? Uh, it's a PLX Oxnet 7020. PLX Oxnet? Okay, it's, it's running the Oxnet chip. Um, they're both good chips. Uh, this one doing great for me. Doesn't need cooling, or well, I mean, of course it needs cooling, but it's all passive cooling, um, and uh, it's a great little device. You've got gigabit Ethernet and, and four USB ports. 
What does it run? Well, it's running Arch Linux. Ta-da! And I didn't know anything about Arch Linux until you know, probably 18 months ago when I needed a distribution that would fit on that. Um, there's others, but this is just happened to be the one with the best documentation. Um, Arch is known as the distribution with, with, uh, with great documentation. In fact, the other distributions ref many times will refer to Arch documentation if you want to know, if you want to know how to do something. So just for that alone, it's you know, gold mine. Um, IP tables run, uh, NFS, OpenLDAP, Samba, uh, the Apache web server um, is running, and, uh, uh, and Postfix. So, you know, all, all this great software is running on the device, and I, I, I did a, I did a, uh, I ran top on the machine just to, you know, Expecting that you know the server would be at 80, 85 percent capacity or something like that, and five uh, percent. The you know, with all that stuff running, five percent. Um, wish I could show you right now. I mean, we might be able to debug it um, later and, and be able to see what's running on it. But uh, yeah, I mean, of course, it, w it wasn't really doing anything. It just had the programs you know loaded and ready to go. But still, even with that. 5% CPU and maybe maybe 25% memory. Um, again, the server's only got one client, so it doesn't have to, it, it can run a whole bunch of programs because um, it's only going to serve me. You know, that's it. One mailbox, you know, one open LDAP session, um, S, you know, one SSH session, that's it. Simple. Um, we did the cost co comparison, um, and here I wanted to uh, do a little do a little demo about what this what this little guy can do. Uh, this kind of ties in to what what I was doing uh, the presentation I did last year about how the Pogo plug with Apache uh, HTTP server on it can actually serve as a boot server. Um, so you can actually boot from the Pogo plug, and let's go, go ahead through, through, uh, through these three programs, DNS Mass, Apache, and iPixie. Um, DNS Mass uh, serves as the TFTP server, um, and it also specifies where the iPixie program is, is, is located so that uh, um, the, the, the machine can then load iPixie, which allows it to do HTTP. Once, it, once it's able to do HTTP, then it can download very efficiently an image from, uh, from the network and go ahead and boot. This right here is a very old gateway laptop, um, probably 2004 model, yeah, 10 years, 10 years old. Um, and let's go ahead and see if it can boot. How are we doing on time? Fourteen more minutes. All right, excellent. Uh, okay. It isn't quite. We're missing the first uh, first four characters of the display, um, which is kind of important because it says the ACP. Um, and if you ever get this. What you should be seeing is, oh, let me just walk over here. Um, this says client and DHCP, and it's, so it's trying to get DHCP from the network. It's not, it's not getting it. Okay, so. So 
so it, it, it fell back to the default distribution on here, which is which is Debian. Um, so, and the reason that is happening is because we do not have a program running called uh, called the DNS mask, and I need to be SSH'd into it to do that. <laughs> uh, well. Well, let's try it. We got we got we got some time here. So, um, yeah. Second demo I was going to do is was uh, was do an open LDAP query. Um, these are the references for that. I'm going to minimize that and go to. Oh. Oh. Okay, I find I kind of flew through my uh, through through my slides and I ended up on that on that question slide. Um, this would be a good time to answer questions. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I don't see any see questions about uh, the, the setup as I got going now. Anybody? No? Okay. Storage-wise, he had noted um, using the you know, random external two and a half inch drive or whatnot plugged into it. Yeah. Um, do you do, you, uh, is that your preferred additional storage? I think I saw like a little USB stick in there or something. Do you, yeah. Which do you prefer? How do you prefer doing that? And from the cloud perspective, do you do any sort of, uh, uh, I want to say Dropbox stop, you know, uh, cloud uh, storage synchronization type stuff? Yeah, um, I, it's, it's very much a work in progress right now. Um, what, what I did have this Pogo plug hooked up to was a 1.5 terabyte drive that was formatted with uh, NTFS. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, you know, I got a whole bunch of pictures on it because my wife had stored a whole bunch of uh, pictures on this, NTF, uh, on this NTFS formatted drive. And I said, well, I really don't know if NFS could, can, can serve this um, this NTFS format of drive, I mean, it, it should be able to, but I didn't, I, I, I didn't know, but I wanted to prove it. So I said, well, instead of me taking all that data off and reformatting it as ext3, I just said, well, let's, let's just leave it as uh, NTFS and see if NFS can serve it. Um, turns out it can. Um, it's, it's just the design of NFS that it, it doesn't care about how the uh, the server itself is storing the data as long as it can get it, you know. And um, and with NTFS, you get the permissions that uh, that FAT32 doesn't have. Um, so that's uh, so why I, I thought, well, uh, it, it should work. It should it, it should work relatively well that way. But I didn't want to carry a 1.5 terabyte drive and have an even bigger complication. So I just replaced it with the, a 16 gig. Uh, thumb drive right there and, and ran NFS off of that. So, um, would it, so uh, getting, getting back to your question, is, is there a way to hook it up to a, a drive in the cloud that, uh, you know, some kind of secure way to hook it up to a drive in the cloud? Um, if this is your cloud replacement, quote yeah, unquote. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, the, the terabyte drive is, the, uh, is, is my cloud repl re replacement. I mean, we've got all the pictures and everything that, that, that I need to connect to. Um, and the, uh, the way to, uh, to, to connect to it from, say, um, uh, McDonald's or, you know, 
Starbucks or, or something like that is, uh, is a technique called, uh, um, you use the SSH tool um, and I believe, it, I, haven't, I haven't actually done it yet, but, but uh, there's a, there's a it's, it's called SSH port, port forwarding um, where you can tunnel back into this device from the, uh, from the McDonald's um, and know that all your, your internet traffic is being done through that device instead of through McDonald's Wi-Fi, you know, hotspot. You know, they can see the traffic, but it's encrypted and, you know, it, it doesn't matter. If I may. Yes, Jason, uh, please. There is, obviously because it's also running Linux, you can use any software package that is capable of being compiled and run on it. So on Cloudworks, uh, believe it or not, BTSync actually works on it. It's not the fastest thing in the world on this little guy, but it does work. And there are multiple other options. Own Cloud, in, in particular, is a PHP based. Uh, so you can configure it with Nginx and PHP FPM and use Own Cloud to do the syncing with that. In addition to that, you get an Android client, you get an interactive HTML5 web page that you can use and has all of the nice front end pieces that you'd use in a standard browser from a laptop, tablet, etc. So Own Cloud is one example. Uh, it's one that I've seen multiple people use, and I've seen it done more extensively. We do have that actively packaged. Any other questions? Um, this is, it's really ticking me off that I can't demo the, uh, the being able to do the, the network booting from a, from a Pogo plug. Uh, so so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna figure this, Holy cow. All right, laptop just uh, decided to die. Um, I'm gonna figure this out and have it, have it ready for, if, if there's an extra birds of a feather going around, um, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna take up that one and, um, and be able to demo it that, at that time. It was, it was working so great last night. Um, and then <laughs> it was working here too. I did have one question. So anyway, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I guess part one is looking at this as a replacement for your cloud service. This is yeah. more cloud data, but it wouldn't be good hosting for cloud services. Well, yeah, because as long as it's only serving one person, I'm good. But as soon as, as, soon as you get over, I'm, I'm guessing 10 people that, you know, the server's going to melt down <laughs> with all the stuff I got running on it. Um, so yeah, I, I, ju I just see it as a, as, as, a, as a way to learn um, uh, how, to, how, to, how to run a, um, a, a distribution, Arch Linux, which is a rolling release distribution as a server on a, uh, and on a very small embedded device. Um, and people would generally recommend that you not run a rolling server release on uh, uh, just because it's so hard to keep up and every update that you may make to the server is, you know, might break something. Um, so, so I don't, I don't re recommend it for production use, but it is a great learning tool and I haven't had any problems with it so far, you know, knock on wood. Um, and, and of course, I'm, I'm still learning about all this SSH foo. Um, the uh, what, what's really nice about SSH is that you can it, it eliminates the passwords. So if you use uh, a program called SSH Keygen, it'll generate your public and private key pairs. The public part of that of that key is, is a separate file called usually id underscore rsa dot, dot pub. You take that key and put it on into a file called uh, authorized keys in your, yeah, in your SSH directory. Yeah. Okay, so I'm you know, talking really basic to a, to a bunch of people that already know all this stuff. So. a follow-up question. Yeah. So maybe I just don't understand. Uh, that Arch Linux software for the operating system probably didn't come on the embedded device, right? Did you put that on there? Is it run off the hard drive? Uh, yeah, that was a that was definitely a post install. <laughs> uh, it comes with an embedded version. 
uh, of, I think it's not even, uh, it's not even OE code. It's actually from L2J. Hmm. Very, very good. So I guess it's fairly esoteric then? It, well, it's, it's a device meant to provide a cloud access point to the consumer that then needs for a service for aggregation and access. So, I mean, it's very task specifically built. And you can run, uh, for example, I packages that are from SLE2. There's a whole set of software distribution that work for that. But if you wanted to do something in addition to what that's capable of, and especially on a more modern set of code, then that's where you would look into either running Arch or Debian. I believe there's even a Gen 2 one. Yeah. Um, the the I actually used a um, a web page uh, to to build this uh, Arch distribution that, that's not on the Arch Linux wiki. Um, it's published by a guy named um, Y T Lan, or his, user, his, his handle is Y T Lan, um, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll get to here in a second. My when my laptop boots up. Um, but uh, yeah, it had a, had a perfect, it had this install right here for this E02 uh, from soup to nuts. And I, was, I just followed that recipe right down, right down, right down the page and, and it worked. Um, the, th the things I had to do extra were uh, install OpenLDAP, okay? That took a full month um, of just, you know, just going back and, you know, Back and forth, trying new things, and uh, actually ended up writing a script that would that would in, that would install OpenLDAP uh, on Arch Linux and enable TLS authentication, right, um, and, and and do all the configuration for you right out of the box. Um, and I posted that on the Arch Linux uh, wiki. If you search for Arch Linux and OpenLDAP, you'll get right to that page, and and you won't have to go through the the heartache I did trying to get the uh, open that running on the, on that box uh, because everybody publishes a, a, a how to page for how to get open that running non securely right <laughs> and then, but the last mile come on the last mile is the important part we want TLS we want secure security um, and, and that, that, that that's the hard part but that, that script I published on on open that for for Arch Linux that does it. Uh, of course, after that, you, you then you got to define your your organization structure. But, uh, but at least you got the uh, at least you got the open all that installed and configured and working. Okay, I think you're able to answer my question somewhere in there. Is that <laughs> you're able to put basically any operating system on there through fairly normal means? You wouldn't have to hack the device at all. The, basically, it's rather simple. They do allow you to go into their interface and enable SSH. So you can either do that, or you pop the case and attach a 3.3 volt TTL, a 3.3 volt TTL serial to it, and then you get basically a serial console login right there, and you can do it from there. But you have to, you can't just pop in an ISO and magically it works. There is a slight bit more complication to it. But beyond that, it's actually not that complicated. It's a, what, maybe a six or a seven step process, which includes doing the download of whoever's root of S you're using. Wonder our, oh, okay. Yeah, in the, in the references for this presentation, here it is, this first link right here, YTLAN, installing, well, Oh, uh, come on, wireless, get up there. Okay, here we go. I know we only have three minutes left. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna hold you. Um, 
and the next presenter. Who uh, is the next presenter in here? Hey, Donald, when's the next presentation start? Is that 9.15? Uh, yeah, yeah, ten fifteen. Okay, all right, we're good, we're good. So, I'll let's try this again. We have wireless, wireless. Sure, yeah. Well, if uh, if you need the link. It's ytlan.com blog installing Arch Linux on a, on a Pogo plug. There's, this is the link for, the second one is the link for Open LDAP and then uh, getting iPixie and DNS uh, working together with, uh, with the, the Apache web server um, is this third link. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you all for coming. Um, see me afterward if uh, you got any other questions. Thank you. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.